Hi, I'm Tom Park, Director of Software Solutions at Berry Consultants. In this video, I'd like to introduce you to the new platform trial simulation facilities in FACTS, our fixed and adaptive clinical trial design simulator. Now, a platform trial is a relatively new type of trial that became of critical importance during the COVID-19 pandemic, finding ways of treating the disease faster than ever before. In a platform trial, one is continuously testing treatments with new ones entering the trial as others complete, and is a stunningly efficient way to do clinical research. This is the first commercially available and validated software for the design and simulation of platform trials. Let's take a look at what FAX provides. So it's new in FAX 7.0, it's a whole new simulation engine, and what it can simulate are these perpetual platform trials with multiple end treatments in them, some of them starting at the beginning, and then finishing, and other treatments coming in, uh, and then leaving the trial over time. So here you can see a, a sort of example graph with time across the bottom on the x-axis, different bars representing different treatments. You can see here we've started with treatment one and two at the very outset. Treatment three comes in uh, and then starts recruiting. Treatment four comes in. Uh, treatment four, treatment two and four have ended. Treatment five gets a start having hung around waiting for the ability to enter and so on over time. Uh, then down here we have the control arm which we're recruiting to into the whole time. And then we in this particular graph, we also show the cumulative patient recruitment into the different treatment arms with this black control continuing to recruit over time. This is, in fact, is, is very much a, a version 1.0 of the simulator. And in order to get one going, what we've concentrated on is simulating relatively simple phase two screening trials. And rather than exhaustively going over the, the different features, what we're going to do here is just look at a simple example, and then we'll evolve the design, uh, adding in uh, a couple of features and refine the design, and then look at how those features have affected the operating characteristics. So what we're going to set up is a trial which is going to investigate nine treatments over a period of about three years. There'll be two initial treatments and then a new treatment will become available roughly every five months. And the sort of disease we're going to simulate is one where there's a, a continuous endpoint. So we're scoring patients on their mean change from baseline uh, over 12 weeks. The standard deviation of this endpoint is, is two points. And what we're looking for is uh, some kind of improvement compared to control in the range of between sort of 0.8 and 1 point. Um, because this is stage two, the type one error is uh, R, the, the pharmaceutical company, company running this trial, it's R. Um, it's our choice of what the type one error is. And we're prepared to accept quite a high rate of say about 10%. 10% with about an 80 to 90% power to find an effective treatment. This allows us to have a relatively small sample size of 53 per arm uh, using a conventional sample size calculation. Uh, we've got a 5% dropout rate, so we, we round that up to 55 subjects per arm. And our expect expectation is that roughly one in three of these nine treatments is, is gonna be effective, though of course we, we don't know which ones. So I'm going to just show you the screens and explain uh, briefly in overview how we enter this platform trial details into fax, and then we'll switch to fax and we'll, we'll actually sort of do it live. So like the other designs in fax, we have this sort of standard tab layout across the top where the first tab is going to allow us to enter the details of the trial. The second tab, the virtual response, is how we're going to simulate the, the patient responses in different scenarios to test our design. Another tab, which is going to specify how patients accrue during the trial. And then we start to get onto the design aspects, the first of which is, well, what is it when we analyze the data that we're going, we want to calculate in order to take decisions, our quantities of interest. Then we'll have the tab where we'll actually look at the design elements 
and then finally we'll we'll get to the simulation. So setting up the sort of ground rules of the trial, it looks not unlike some of the other areas of facts, uh, but there are some differences. So over here is very similar. We say, oh, do we want to, are we going to do an adaptive design or a fixed design? And if we select fixed, then you know, there's, there's a couple of the uh, tabs can be presented a little bit more simply uh, than if it was adaptive. Uh, we have uh, an option to use longitudinal modeling, which is grayed out because it's not implemented at the moment, but that's a sign that it's definitely something we intend to add. And we have the option in a continuous endpoint of also simulating baseline score and baseline score having some correlation to the effective, the, 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 the end response. In the trial information, we can specify in a number of different ways how we want the simulation to stop. Now, in a platform trial, our simulation is quite different from simulating a conventional trial. In a conventional trial, you have a maximum sample size. You might stop early, but whenever you get to that maximum sample size, the trial is going to end. A platform trial is, is quite different. Um, you set it up probably with an, an initial you know, budget and possible sample size, but you're going to hope as more treatments come along that you could test that you, there will be additional budget and that trial just keeps on running. And, and so, but in order to do simulations, we have to have some cutoff point. In fact, what we're looking at is not the entire trial, because we don't know what that's going to be, but we'll look at some initial phase, probably the first nine treatments, that's quite a lot, to give us an understanding of, of, of how the trial will perform. So we can set maximums uh, to stop the simulation in terms of time, we can set a maximum number of weeks, or a maximum total sample size, uh, or we could tell the simulation to stop after a certain number of successes. Here I'm, I'm not going to set any of those limits, but we will in a moment see that I specify I just want to simulate nine treatments overall, and that's what's going to cap the simulation. And I say, this is how many patients, I maximum number of patients I want on a treatment, 55, and the maximum number of treatments that I, I will allow in to be in the trial at any one time, because obviously if you have too many, the subjects are getting divided between all of them, and every single treatment will now enroll rather slowly. And then we have a couple of other options that will be familiar, whether a high response is an improvement or, or a low response is an improvement, and the time it takes to see the, the final endpoint on a subject here. It's uh, going to be three months. Another new feature in the platform trial simulator, one that we may retrofit to other areas of facts, is we can specify uh, a simple threshold uh, at which we want any simulated treatment arm, if it's true simulated responses above this level, then we would like it to be a success. Uh, and then we can set another level, which if the truth is below that, we would want it to be found to be failure. Uh, and that will allow the, the fax user interface, after the simulations are done, to, to kind of score our simulation results and tell us how what percentage of successful arms in a, across a simulations of a scenario, what percentage of them were correctly found, how many were incorrectly found, and so on. Then we need to specify the trial arms, and we do that over two tabs. The first one is simply creating a list of arms and having the option, which I'm not used here, uh, to, to give them uh, meaningful names, should you have uh, names for the treatments that are coming in, or some of them. And then we have another tab where we create the treatment arrival schedule. And this is done by specifying an arrival window, the earliest it might arrive and the latest. Uh, and then we simply uh, stochastically uh, sample from that, uh, that interval uh, with, in a uniform manner uh, to, to, within each simulation to find that treatment's arrival time. And then we also have a, a maximum waiting time so that there's a limit of how many treatments can be in this, the trial. In this case, we've specified up to four. So these later treatments, if they arrive and all the earlier four treatments are still there, they will have to wait until at least one of them is completed. And we can set a maximum waiting time that said, well, if, if it's been hanging around for over a year, then the, uh, the clinical team responsible at compound are, uh, are going to get fed up and they're, they're going to want their, their compound treated some other, tested some other way. And then we can specify the virtual subject response, as we can in, in many other parts of facts, but here it's, it's looking a bit different. 
And it's different in two ways. The first way is that <clears throat> rather than just specifying a particular response, we can specify it in terms of a, a mean effect, that is to say relative to the control arm. Then it allows us to simulate the control arm, not necessarily at a fixed rate, but from some, some sample sampling from some distribution. We can also specify that a treatment effect is sampled from some distribution. So our second scenario, RESP2, uh, I've used all fixed uh, effects. So every simulation, each arm will be simulated with the same true treatment effect. Treatments 1 and 2 will be 0. Treatment 3 will be effective with a response rate of 0.7. Uh, so treatments 4 and 5 will be 0, so null. Treatment 7 and 8 will be null. Treatment 6 has a treatment effect of 0.8. And treatment 9 has a treatment effect of 0.9. But in the second scenario, well, actually it's the first, RESP1, um, I've made them all sample from a distribution. And then we have a further tab where we can specify the distributions. Here we just have the, the one, so they're all using the same. And I've specified that we're, what we're sampling is the effect size for each treatment. Uh, there is a 66% chance that the effect size is zero. So we've got this kind of zero inflation. Uh, and then if it's not zero, then the effect size is taken from a, a normal distribution. There are some other options. Uh, and um, that normal distribution, I've given a mean of 0.8 but a standard deviation of 0.2. So there'll be quite a spread of, of different effects. And that, I think, reflects relatively realistically, uh, perhaps a little optimistic that uh, only two thirds of the treatments will be null, uh, but, but relatively realistically, the, the uncertainty at, at phase two as to exactly what the treatment effect will be. We can specify, like in the other, uh, other areas of facts, a, a dropout rate per, per arm, uh, an accrual profile, and our quantities of interest. Uh, and here we're just going to be interested in the Bayesian posterior probability of, of being better than control. Then we get to the design features, and we specify separately the uh, how we're going to analyze control, uh, which is nice and simple, just a simple normal prior for a, uh, an analysis of a continuous endpoint. Here I've set the mean at zero, which is our expected response on control. And I've given it a standard deviation of four, which is twice the standard deviation of the endpoint. So the variance of the endpoint is, standard deviation of the endpoint is two, so its variance is four. The variance of my prior is 16. So one over the other gives us a fraction of, of one quarter, which gives us the effective sample size of my prior. So my prior is equivalent to one quarter of a person's observation. So it's not going to be particularly informative and will make very, very little difference to the posterior. But by not being sort of completely uninformative, I do help I do help the um, the Bayesian MCMC estimation to converge just that little bit more quickly. And I use the same prior for the treatments, mean of zero, same as control. So shouldn't do any, there won't be any inflation of type 1 error, and the same uncertainty of 4, standard deviation of 4. And we also have a prior for our estimate of sigma, which I've made accurate in the sense that I've given it a mean of 2, uh, but uh, I've given it only a weight of 1, so the equivalent of only a single observation. So that, again, is not particularly informative in our estimate of the, the true sigma, but at least gets the distribution in the right place. Allocation, uh, there are, if we're being adaptive, as we'll see later, there is an uh, ability to have a response adaptive randomization. But here I've said we're fixed, so I only have fixed allocation options. And there are two. I can do a constant proportion allocated to control, or I can allocate dependent on the number of treatments. And here I've elected to ensure that the allocation to eat, any treatment and control is always one to one. So I'm always allocating one to each treatment and one to control. So the block size will increase depending on the number of treatments. Lastly, we're going to set the success and futility criteria. I've said uh, we're happy to have a type 1 error as high as, as 10%. So we do that by using a, in a, using a Bayesian posterior probability. And we say we want our probability being better than control uh, of uh, 
0.9 or more, which is going to give us a roughly 10% time one error. And here I've said uh, what we'll do is if that probability of being better than control is less than 0.75, then we'll definitely declare the uh, treatment a failure. If it's in between, then it's going to end up with a, a kind of an inconclusive uh, outcome that would mean we'd the team would look at other factors to see whether they wanted it to be a, judged a, a success or not and taken forward. And then finally, we get to the simulations tab, which looks like every other simulations tab in fax, and we can run some simulations and take a look at the operating characteristics, which are actually quite different from what you see in the other areas of fax. So I hope I've prepared you for what we're going to be doing, uh, and now we'll just actually go ahead and do that. Uh, in the fax interface. So on our design types, we now have the, the two new platform trial designs, one for a continuous endpoint and one for a dichotomous endpoint. So we're going to load the user interface for continuous endpoint. And we're going to create a fixed design, a 12 week time to endpoint. We're not going to set any maximums for the trial it will just be driven by the number of treatments we'll have a maximum number of subjects per arm of 55 maximum number of treatments in the trial at any one time of four and we'll set these thresholds of 0.6 for what i would like to be judged as a for my the cut point at which i'd like a true treatment effect to to, to be judged as success we're going to create our treatment arms first we need to create them all. So I create my nine, and we need to set the arrivals. We could have multiple arrival profiles to simulate different rates at which treatments can arrive. Here, we're just going to look at the one. Treatments one and two will be in the trial from the outset, so they have an arrival time of zero. And then I'm going to give all the remaining treatments a window which represents them arriving 20 weeks later, but with a 10 week uncertainty either side of that. So the, f the earliest that treatment three could arrive is 10 weeks and the latest 30 weeks. Following on from that, treatment four could be at 30, treatment five at 50, 70, 90, 110, and 130, with corresponding ends of their possible arrivement time for another 20 weeks later. 50, 70, 90, 110, 130, and 150. And we have the default of uh, one year waits uh, if the trial is, is currently full before the new treatment is, is withdrawn and failed to enter the, the trial. For the treatment response, we're going to have two response profiles. The second one, the standard deviation of the endpoint is two. They're all going to use a fixed mean effect relative to control. Control's going to have a response of zero for simplicity. And in fact, treatments one and two will be zero. Treatment three is 0.7. Four and five are zero. Treatment six is 0.8. 7 and 8 are also null, and then the final treatment will have a treatment effect of 0.9. And then the other scenario is going to sample from a distribution, so I need to make sure I've got a distribution. So here's my distribution on this X size with a probability of being null of 0.66, and then if it's not null, we'll have an effect size with a mean of 0.8 and a standard deviation of 0.2. And then we make all the treatments in this response. All these treatments in their simulation sample from that distribution. So at the start of each sim simulated trial, in fact, samples from the distribution to fix the, the true response for that simulation uh, for each of the arms. So in each simulation, these will be different uh, coming from the, the different possible truths. And we also need to remember to set the standard deviation of the arm to two. We're gonna use just a simple 5% dropout rate for each arm. 
an accrual of, oh, two and a half. Uh, and then we just take the, the standard QIs. In fact, we, we don't need a predicted probability of future success, although that might be interesting. We're simply going to use the, the Bayesian posterior probability of being better than control. And later on, we'll use the probability of being maximum. And then our design. So as I said, the prior for the control, we'll have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of four, and the same for each for all the treatments. And then our prior for at the estimate of sigma, we'll have a mean of two and a weight of one. So all pretty simple and non-informative, but set up in the right, roughly the right area. And then you can see that the treatment allocation I've got is actually the setup as the default. That is to say, for each, depending on the number of treatments currently in the trial, we're specifying that we'll allocate one to each of the treatments and one to the control, giving us a, an increasing block size. So the ratio of treatment between any, so the ratio of allocation between any treatment and control remains at one to one no matter how many treatments are, are in the trial. And that has some nice properties, um, you know, avoiding uh, sort of potential biases if things change over time. And then lastly, we need to set the success and futility criteria, which is that the pro post Bayesian posterior probability of being better than control has to be greater than 0.9 to be a success. And if it's less than 0.75, we'll declare it a failure, and it definitely won't go forward to phase three. And here I'm just going to run 100 simulations, but you can see how fast this is. Oh, it needs, wants me to say where to save it. So this is going to simulate each scenario in parallel on two different threads, two different cores. Uh, I haven't given it a smaller packet size, and you can see in just a few seconds we've we've got the hundred simulations done. So even doing a thousand simulations doesn't take very long, but you don't really want to sit and watch the progress bar go even for a few seconds, really, in a in a video. So uh, we do the the old here's one I did earlier trick, and we'll open the one where I've already got the thousand simulations. And we'll take a look at the operating characteristics that we might want to look at. So we can look at what the duration of the trial is, the meanness number of subjects recruited. Uh, here's a novel one, the, the mean number of treatments enrolled and analyzed in the trial, mean number of treatments that were successes, the mean number that were correctly successes. So in other words, the treatment met my criteria I set on the trial tab of having a, a simulated treatment effect of at least 0.6 and was also a success. Similarly, we've got mean futilities and correct futilities. And then from those, we can calculate what the proportion of correct successes and incorrect successes were and similarly correct and incorrect futilities. The number of trials with one or more successes. And another interesting operating characteristic is the mean time to the first successful treatment. Obviously, in this second scenario, uh, that, that's almost always going to be the time to treatment three, which is the first successful uh, treatment we simulate. Um, uh, in the upper one, this, of course, is going to also depend on the, the stochastic sampling of, of what the uh, in each simulation, the stochastic sampling of what the treatment effect should be for each treatment. So that's kind of, if you like, we'll have a wider dispersion and is, is less predictable. Uh, then we've got times in which treatments started, completed, uh, analyzed. And then we can look individually at each treatment it, if it's the proportion of times it was a success. So you can see to here the 
second scenario is, is, is most useful uh, because here we, we know what the truth is every time. So treatments one and two are null. And so we can see, again, our proportion of successes are around our required 10% rate. Treatment three was simulated with a, a treatment effect rate of 0.7. Uh, and you can see we have a, about a 74% power. And again, again, we have two nulls around 10% type 1 error. Treatment 6 was simulated with a treatment effect of, of 0.6, uh, sorry, 0.8, and has over 80% power. And then finally 0.9 has a treatment effect of uh, over 90% power. Uh, so here's, here's a summary of, of all those operating characteristics we can look at. And we can also look at, per treatment, uh, we can look at its mean start time and end time, its proportion of success, futility, inconclusivity, the mean estimate of the response, the mean allocation to it, the mean dropouts, and a mean value for each of its quantity of in, each quantity of interest that we calculated. So here's our first simulation. It's capped only by the number of treatments. So the mean participants and duration is perhaps just depends on the accrual rate and when the treatments arrive, so perhaps not so interesting. One of the interesting quantities was this mean number of treatments enrolled. And although we only stop when we've looked at all nine treatments, um, it's, it's actually about 8.2. But so, so why isn't it nine? So we can take a look at uh, some of these. Perhaps, well, and we can look at the individual simulation results. So each line now is an individual simulation. And we can look at the number of subjects allocated to each treatment. And sure enough, each one gets 55, 55, 55. And oh, what's happening here? So we can see, particularly on, there's a couple, was, was one there on treatment eight, but there's actually the majority of treatment nine, it gets no allocation at all. And if we take a look at the graphs, we have here a couple of, we have a few sort of summary graphs, but now we have some that are per simulation, and we have that sort of Gantt chart graph, and you can see treatment nine here never enters the trial. And you can see, let's just set the axis and make this a little clearer. Um, probably don't need a fixed maximum of more than about. 250, uh, and then I think probably 11 tick marks. So you can see treatment nine comes in just sometime before week 150. It's only going to hang around to uh, one year, so another 50 weeks, so up to week 200. And throughout that time, you can see that there's at least, the, the, no, there's always four other treatments in the trial. So the trial is at the maximum number of treatments. Treatment nine doesn't get in, uh, and it's waiting time times out, and so it never enters the trial. For some of those, th there are simulations where it does. So there it enters the trial. So here, it's arrival time. Some, well, what must have happened is that the arrival time of some of the other treatments must have been sufficiently early that they've, they've managed to end just before uh, trial that treatment nine's um, waiting time has elapsed. And of course, this will also be sensitive to uh, accrual rates. So if we change the accrual rate, then again, things might change uh, in terms of how many treatments we, we actually get to look at and how many get turned away. So a new problem to consider as you're designing your platform trial. Um, so we've got these, these are the mean successes, mean correct successes, mean proportions of correct successes, proportion of trials with one or more successes and one or more correct successes, the mean first, I mean, success to first week. So I'm presenting two numbers here, one from each scenario. The first one is from the first scenario where results are sampled from distribution. And the second is from the scenario where I have a fixed response that's being simulated. And by looking at the, in the second scenario, um, where we've got 
fixed treatment effects. Um, if we can look at we can look at the treatments where we know the treatment effect is zero, we can est we can check our type one error, which is sure enough around ten percent, and we can look at the three with the treatments with fixed treatment effects, and we can look at their power. So we can see their respective power. So the the treatment the, the power is going up with the later treatments because the treatment effects increased, but there will also be an element of increase in power because the analysis is comparing to the full control arm, and of course the number of control patients will be going up uh, by those. So one of the limitations of FAX 1.0, uh, sorry, 7.0, the sort of 1.0 of the platform trial simulator, is that we only have um, the, the option to compare against the whole control arm. Um, other options like only comparing to concurrent control will be coming in a, a later version. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how adding in um, the option to early stop is going to affect these operating characteristics. So I'm going to simply add uh, three interims or, or three milestones per arm. So when an arm reaches 25%, 50%, 75% complete, uh, it'll have roughly 13, 26, or 39 subjects complete. If it's a total of 55. Um, now, in a platform trial, it's hard to schedule interims um, because we, the rate of accrual into an arm is going to depend on, on how many treatments there are. And it, it's also, if we have multiple treatments in the trial, you might have different treatments triggering their interims you know, relatively close to each other. So you've started doing an interim then all of a sudden you also have to do another one. Uh, and this, this would be uh, quite problematic for the uh, people doing the operations, collecting the data, performing the analysis. So what's much more commonly done in a platform trial is to have a regular update. So everyone, everything, the, the planning and the logistics are all much simpler. So say we do it every, every two months, every eight weeks, which in this trial will correspond to about 20 subjects being recruited. And then at each interim, one does the analysis, but then you, also, you can also look to see if any arm has met its milestone for the first time and its interim actions should be uh, enacted. In this case, stopping early for either success or futility. And we'll also set the time of the first interim in the trial at 42 subjects complete, because we'll have um, two treatments and the control arm being allocated to and so we should just have over, uh, we should have probably 13 or more likely 14 subjects on each arm. So they will have just met their, their first interim criteria at that point. So this is when the interims are going to be. But we're going to have to decide on what our stopping criteria should be. Now we're going to just have simple ones just looking at that Bayesian posterior probability of being better than control. But we'll have to determine what the limits are that means, oh, this is so good we could stop for success, or this is so bad we should stop for futility. Um, uh, I have a particular way that I like to choose those limits, which we can do, we can look at in the platform trial simulator. So uh, what I'm going to do is first of all set up those interims. So I have to change this to an adaptive trial. Then on the design tab, I now have a new tab that says trial updates. So I'm going to take the first stop at 42 subjects and then every eight weeks after that. So those are the updates when we look at the data. Uh, and that's going to be in terms of patients complete. And then I'm going to define separately the milestones for each arm as to when, when its interim conditions will be considered. And I said these would be at 13, 26, and 39 subjects. What we will need to do is then set criteria here on how to stop uh, at those uh, interim looks. But it's kind of hard to know what to set those levels at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some simulations. So I've specified the interims, but I haven't specified any stopping rules. I'm going to run just 100 simulations, and I'll make sure I output weeks files for all of them. 
And then there's a couple of graphs we can look at, which are going to help us choose what the thresholds for early stopping should be. Because we're now doing updates and interim analyses, these simulations take just a little bit longer to run than the, the first simple ones did. We're probably doing three or four more analyses uh, than we did previously. The previous one was going to do an analysis every time a treatment finished. Now we're doing some uh, in between times, but it's still pretty quick. So we want to use the second um, scenario where we've got fixed responses. So we know what we're looking at, six null cases or ones where we want power. And I'm going to look at the explore early futility and early success criteria graphs. So we'll look at early explore the early success criteria and we'll look for treatment one at the probability of being better than control. And here, what it's the graph is showing me that at different threshold values, um, if the probability is greater than uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.55, 0 0.6 and so on, all the way up to greater than 0.99, how many of the simulations would have stopped early? Now this is a, for success. Now this is a null case, so I don't want to stop for success, early for success, that's going to inflate my, my type 1 error. I'm already very happy with my 10% type 1 error. I don't want it going much higher. So uh, I can see that I, I need uh, one of these thresholds down here, maybe a 0.99 or 0.98. I can, I can emphasize that line. So the, the line done in yellow is, is this line I have picked out here uh, at 0.98. Uh, and you can see that's, that's going to give erroneously stop me early for success about 5% of the time. But my overall time and error is I'm allowing it to be up to 10%. And I'm, I'm guessing that, that quite a significant proportion of those um, would have been type, will be type 1 errors anyway. So this, I'm not, I'm not expecting too much inflation of my type 1 error with that stopping rule. If in later on with simulations, if it actually does look too high, we can come back and, and, and make this a little bit more conservative. We can also look at a treatment like treatment three to see if this is going to have much in the way of benefit. So you can see in treatment three, which has the lowest of the effective responses, 0.7, um, we're going to stop roughly 20% of the trials at interim one, uh, a further 10% at interim two, and a, a, another 10% or, or more at interim three. So that's not fantastic, but it's probably worth having. And also uh, treatment nine was even more effective, and that might stop even sooner. Here you can see it's looking a little bit odd, because treatment nine isn't always making it into the trial. Treatment six might be a better indication of a more successful. Uh, so that's showing a little bit more successful, early stopping up to 50%. <clears throat> and we can do the reverse. We can look at the futility criteria. It takes a little while to draw these graphs because it's, 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 it's crawling over all the, um, all the 100 weeks files computing for each of the simulations when this treatment would have stopped. Uh, and here we can now look at for drop, drop, stopping for early stopping for futility for an arm with a, a good but not great response, the response of 0.7. Uh, and it looks like a stopping around about 0.15. will stop us erroneously for futility less than 5% of the time. And we've probably got a, a power here of 75%. Of so we've, we've already got a 25% um, type 2 error. Uh, and this 
additional 5% is probably all going to be just stopping the trials that would have been failures anyway early. So we shouldn't see too much further erosion of the, of the power. Um, so, so doing that allows us to, to pick our early stopping for success and futility thresholds. And we can then set those. So we create a criteria at milestone one. That's going to, and we're going to allow early stopping for futility if that probability is less than 0.15 and allow stopping for success if that probability is greater than 0.98. And then we can go off and once again we can run some simulations. So you can see the, the mean number of subjects has come down slightly, so that's because early stopping. You can see the mean duration has come down slightly, again, because we've stopped early. Something that we wanted to see has happened, which is we, we're now looking at, on average, 8.9 treatments per simulation, and our total is 9. So we're, we're getting to look at treatment 9 now, probably. 90% uh, of the time rather than 30% of the time. And that correspondingly has led to a greater number of successes in, in the second first scenario because we're just looking at more arms. In the second scenario, uh, a bigger increase because we've treatment nine has got the greatest simulated response. Uh, the mean number of correct has gone up, again, particularly in that second scenario. Uh, and also interesting, our mean time to first success has come down. Um, this is, will be due to uh, early stopping. Um, first of all, early stopping for futility, either treatment one or treatment two, will allow us to recruit more quickly into treatment three, which is our first effective treatment. But also we've got early success stopping, uh, and so that also uh, when treatment three stops early for success, that also would have contributed to this mean for success time coming down. So this you might, exp and then obviously uh, that's in a very specific scenario. Probably the more compelling number is in this one scenario where we've, we've sampled across the, the treatment effect in every scenario, uh, in every simulation, uh, and even there we've we've got a reduction of uh, of nearly thirty weeks to the time to we find our first success. So that's something that, that, you know, management you'd think would find a quite compelling reason for introducing early stopping into their high, high throughput screening study. And then the last thing we're going to look at uh, is seeing if we can improve things still further using response adaptive randomization. So we're going to keep the same randomization ratio as before if there's one treatment, it'll be randomized one to, one to one with control. If there's two treatments, we'll randomize the treatments to control at two to one. If there's three treatments, we'll randomize the treatments to control at three to one. And if there's four treatments, we'll randomize the treatments to the control at four to one. But now instead of allocating equally between the treatments, we will do response adaptive randomization within those slots that have been dedicated to the treatments. Obviously, nothing's going to change if there's only one treatment, but if there's two or more, we're going to do rather than equal allocation to each treatment, we're now going to allocation in proportion to which we think that treatment has the maximum effect. One slight limit on that is that we'll give every arm at least its first 12 participants enrolled uh, at a, at a, as though it was a fixed rate, so it'll have the same rate as control, um, before it starts to be get the RAR treatment, the response adaptive randomization treatment. Uh, and this is quite simply done by going onto this allocation tab and modifying the allocation rules. We go from fixed allocation to adaptive. The allocation um, here uh, is now one, two, three, four to one, depending on the number of treatments. We specify the minimum number of subjects we want to enroll. And then here we specify the rule we want to control the RAR. And here we've done the possibly the simplest possible, which is to say all the re allocation between 
the treatments, we want to be proportional to the probability that that treatment has the maximum response. We could, uh, if we had a bigger trial with, with more subjects uh, required on each arm, uh, we might want to sort of moderate that and, and add in a, in addition, a static allocation, probably equal allocation between the arms, and then split the adaptive allocation into half, one actually adaptive and the other half static. So you know, preserving some underlying allocation to each arm. But here we're going to be um, quite aggressive and, and see what happens. So we, we, as I said, we can do this quite simply. On the allocation tab, we go from fixed to adaptive. Again, we have to remove the simulations we've already got because the, the design is changing. We change the number of adaptive slots to keep the allocation ratio to control sort of effectively one-to-one. -one. We set the minimum number of subjects we want to allocate to each arm to 12, because obviously our overall allocation is only 55, it's quite modest. And we set our target, which in this case is going to be the probability that the arm has the maximum response. And we'll give it away to one, although it doesn't really matter exactly what that is, because that's the only rule we're going to, or only rule we're going to use. And now that's done, and we can click select all the scenarios and restart the simulations. But again, I've already got some results uh, from a thousand simulations, and we can look across at how these this design change, this further design change has, has changed things. And by and large, it's made very little difference. Um, we, we, we're still recruiting about the same as we did for early stopping, which is not surprising because the the RAR doesn't result in fewer subjects going on the poorly performing arms. They just come on later when all the good arms have, have finished. And so similarly, the, the duration hasn't changed uh, and the, the mean number of treatments we found hasn't changed uh, and the mean successes hasn't changed. I mean, these all look a little bit different from the early stopping, but they're certainly all within um, sort of the variability of, of the results with only a thousand simulations. So there might be a slight increase in the number of subjects, but it's not uh, convincing. What is clear, though, is we've reduced the time to the first, the mean time to the first success even further by another 10 weeks. And that, of course, is what we would expect with the response adaptive randomization. As soon as a treatment arm looks good, it will get the lion's share of the treatment allocation uh, and it's going to finish sooner. Uh, so yeah, as you can see that's that's resulted in taking a further 10 weeks or so off uh, the time to find it. Uh, we can see from the type 1 error that possibly there is, a, you know, we've got an extra percentage point of type 1 error. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's a, looks like there's a drop in power for the, the, the weakest arm but the rest of the power uh, remains the same. So there might be a little bit of tweaking we want to do on the uh, on our stopping criteria to make them a little more conservative uh, or not. Anyway, that brings our example to a close. Uh, I hope you've found it interesting uh, and I hope you think the, the facilities we have already, even though it's only a kind of a 1.0 level uh, uh, simulator, means that we, we've got some interesting features that we can explore in our platform trial designs. I do hope you've enjoyed that demonstration and that it has inspired you to learn more about trial simulation, platform trials and our trial simulation software. You can find out more at www.berryconsultants.com or email us questions at info at Thank you for watching.